everyone, welcome to the first of Nepean Echo podcasts and um, today we'll be discussing all things related to left ventricular function in the critically ill. Um, my name's Emma, I'm one of the intensive care specialists, I'm one of the um, echo reporting doctors here at Nepean. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And my name's Chris Duncan, I'm one of the intensive care fellows here at Nepean as well. So Chris, what we're going to be doing today with this uh, quick 15-minute session? Um, 15-ish. 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 Yeah. So today we'll be recapping how kind of basic echo approaches, assessment of LV systolic function, basic views, discussing why assessment in the ICU is slightly different to the outpatient setting. Um, and we're going to try and show you how to perform each measurement, including things like fractional area change, fractional shortening, eight point septal separation. All of your our favourite favorite things. Uh, MAPSI, <laughs> tissue Doppler, DP over DT, the huge topic of ejection fraction, um, 3D strain, maybe even tie index or myocardial performance index, and then move on to cardiac output monitoring as well. So for each of these, we'll try to describe some tips and tricks, um, some potential limitations, and some advice for people um, in the difficult to image patient. And the real aim is for us to try and transition people from the basic echo, the basic visual assessment that we do, and try to bridge the gap between comprehensive echo and all the measurements that come in with that. Um, and then at the end of this, we'll try to talk about what we actually genuinely do at the bedside, particularly at two in the morning, um, how we integrate it with all the other conventional things that we do. Um, and uh, then we'll try and pull it together with some cases. So clearly this is an enormous topic. It's not going to take 15 mm. minutes, huge topic. Yeah. So this is going to be split into several shorter videos that we'll try to deliver to you in manageable bite-sized chunks. We can all do this. It's not rocket science. That's mm -hmm. a key thing about it. It seems like there's this big gap between basic echo and advanced echo. And there, there absolutely is. And, and I'm hoping that with some of these podcasts, we can try to, as I say, bridge that a little bit and just break it down. And I think you truly can't be, um, you know, an expert in echocardiography until you understand the limitations of some of this stuff. So, um, it, it is complicated. We're going to, you know, work, we'll work through it with you. We'll break it down and Chris and I will get things wrong and we'll just talk through it and you can have a good laugh at us. Um, all right. Should we move on to some, so how we assess um, left ventricular systolic function? What are some of the tools that we have? Well, this is a huge to topic in itself and one that we're going to have to um, spend a few sessions going through, I think. Um, but when we teach basic echo, we're teaching people to have a, a, a basic visual assessment of what the heart looks like. And that is mostly going to be relying on 2D images using the conventional precordial, parasternal windows, um, apical windows and subcostal windows. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a point and shoot and see what our eye says. Usually which is a, not, good way of which doing is a it, great Chris. way of doing and it, yeah. provided you understand yeah. the limitations of that, that issue. Yeah. Um, so... But when we move on to more comprehensive echo, then lots more techniques come to play. And there are endless mechanisms that people have described to measure um, LV systolic function or systolic performance, whatever the difference between that might be. And um, hopefully we can try and take you through each of those things. But what we'll do firstly is just show you an image um, <laughs> of what our typical to image patient on ICU is like. I think this so, is um, my screen. Yeah, this from is yours, yesterday. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um is that playing, Mark? We've got oh sorry, I have to play that. Goodness. There you go. All right. Does everyone get images like this or is that just me? I feel disappointed now. This is a parasternal long axis view. And as you can see, I mean, what measurements could we do on that at could we do anything on that, Chris? I mean Something's beating in there, isn't it? But Something's moving, and that's about it. Yeah. And we've got massive lung artifact and all of that dropout and lots of clutter, and, you know, it's just a terrible image, isn't it? Um, but sadly, these are the kind of parasternal images, I, you know, as you said, when patients go on their journey, they're sort of intubated, they have all of these things going on, and they're supine and what have you, and we can't get good images. Um, often we'll see, you know, images that look perhaps more like this one where it's completely off axis. Um, could you explain maybe what we've done with the probe on this one, Chris, and how you can tell that that's the case? Yeah, so clearly the precordial, um, the typical precordial windows, say second to fourth intercostal space, um, left sternal edge, um, it's just all lung artifact. We're not seeing anything. 
and this patient's probably positive pressure ventilated. Yes, and so we've just shifted all the mediastinal structures inferiorly. So what we've had to do is move the probe um, down further and further and further until we finally find a, um, a window. And as you can see, the, the LV looks like it's kind of at, a, uh, at a, quite an acute axis. So as you move further down the parasternal windows, the LV will become more and more um, off axis. And so that makes some of the conventional measurements that we do actually quite challenging. So if we take the first measurement that people tend to talk about, often is one of the first images you do if you're doing a comprehensive study, is looking at fractional shortening. Now, fractional shortening is where we measure the LV internal diameter in diastole. And then we also measure it in systole. And then we have the difference. So we take away the LV internal diameter in systole from in diastole, divide it by in diastole and times it by 100. And this gives you a percentage of the area that changes. So we have a video just showing you how we tend to do this. Let me just press play on that. So this is a conventional parasternal, parasternal long axis view. And so we're going to pause that in end and diastole. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, you know, when we're looking at things like this, what are the, you know, what are the limitations? Firstly, with getting a number like fractional shortening, like what is it? What is it? You've talked about what it's telling us. Mm. It's that single line through the ventricle. Absolutely. Um, so, so the the issues with this. Uh, really stem from the fact that the LV is a three-dimensional structure. Um, different parts of the LV have different perfusion. Uh, the LV tends to be split into lots of different segments, up to 17 segments the LV is conventionally split into. And what we're doing here is we're measuring a 2D line that we're trying to equate to being a 3D structure. And whilst there's 17 segments, this only actually looks at the systolic performance of two out of the 17. So if there's any reasonable wall motion abnormalities, if there's any um, changes in the contractility of any other reasons, say things like um, a tapetubo where you've got basal, a hyperdynamic basal segments, then it's going to flatter the systolic function of the LV. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what are some of the, so the fractional shortening, what's the normal value? For that. So normally we're looking at 36% for this one. This is a normal left ventricle. Yeah, this is yeah. a normal left ventricle. So anything less than 25% is okay. pitched as being as being um, abnormal. Um, and so as you can see in these videos, we're going to be um, measuring it in end diastole and then we're going to be measuring it in end systole. And the machine should automatically calculate that for you, which is great. Um, so you can see on there, there's a fractional shortening percentage. But there's also some other numbers that are um, of varying value. So you've got the EF, which is um, ejection fraction. So that's towards the top of the measurement. And it says tyke at the top. So Emma, can you tell me what that means? Oh my goodness. I knew I've, you were never, do that. I've never Tycles. even heard of it. So don't use this measurement. No, no. Yeah. Um, so look, I mean, it's there and we, we ought to know what it is. Not, not only for exams, but I think just, you know, so we no, we could, we've heard of it. So essentially it's using these linear dimensions, what we've just used for fractional shortening. And it, is, it, it takes on a mathematical um, assumption mm -hmm. that the left ventricle is a prolate ellipsoid. And therefore it cubes some of these numbers in a very fancy black boxy equation that I never remember. But it's, you know, to me, it's lots of fudge factors. There's lots of room for error. Um, and as you say, it's that one single plane through the LV. I mean, it's nowhere near representative or good enough for what we need it for, right? It's, I mean, it's it's reasonable. It's I, I often eyeball, not the tie called the but I oft mm. often eyeball the fractional shortening just yep. to get a feel for that basal function. Um, and I sort of take note of it, but it certainly doesn't come into play for change in my clinical management no. for the patient. And also these are linear measurements that are then cubed because cubed. they're a, they're a linear, linear thing that's trying to equate to a three-dimensional structure. And so they cube it. So any error is just going to be amplified. Yeah. And there's another, there's another technique called modified quinones that you may see, but this is a similar kind of thing, uses a slightly different equation, but is again equally as inaccurate as the Tycott's method. Sounds like a fancy drink. It, it does, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, 
So, oh yes, we didn't yeah. mention there, Chris, that we should avoid. You know, if when we're doing these measurements, we should avoid that septal bulge, yes. which a lot of our patients have. They do. Yes, that septal knuckle. Yeah, and also you can see on looking at that image quite how easy it would be to include the posterior papillary apparatus into that measurement. Absolutely, I might rather just point than, that yeah, out just with point my... that out. Um, so there's quite a few lines there, and just taking a, a 2D frozen image, it's, it would be very easy to overcall what the what the area change would be there. Um, the other thing to point out with fractional shortening is that actually this is something that classically was taught to be done with M-mode. Are you using M-mode much to do this? No. So, I mean, we, we did that, didn't we, for fun, just to see whether we could get it on here. But so often you can't, be, you need to be perpendicular for your mm. measurements. And with M-mode, you, you just, you often, so often is just obliquely slicing it. Yeah. So I don't, but I, I do love M-mode for other things. It's temporal resolution. Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about some of the valve structures and things like that. And I, you know, I don't, I, I very much still use M mode, but I don't use it for this, I must admit. Absolutely. And particularly um, in our population where we're going to have an off axis LV, off -axis then it's LV. just exactly. not something that we yeah. can do very effectively. Yeah. Um, so the other measurement that people like to talk about in the parasternal long axis view, uh, particularly I think in the emergency population is something called E point septal separation. And so this is, um, this is where you measure the distance between the uh, maximal anterior movement of the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the septum. So we've got a picture of us doing it here. And so we're measuring that distance between the excursion of the anterior mitral valve and the septum. And the closer it gets to the septum, the more, uh, well, the better the systolic function of the LV is theoretically. Yeah. Now, this is something that, um, well, a normal value, just so everyone is aware, is less than uh, well, anything less than six millimeters is deemed to be normal, and the worse the systolic function gets, the less excursion that mitral valve will have. Yes. Now, can you think of? I mean, uh, it's automatically you can, you know, see some of the problems with this in terms of it, it correlating to ejection fraction, which is Absolutely. right. It, so if you've got things like aortic regurgit things that so this is the as chris was saying this is your anterior mitral leaflet here which you can probably see with with m mode so we get that beautiful sort of look through it and we have the e wave and the a wave right so we're in diastole and it's the point from this this e point separation this is why we put it our cursor on the e point there to the septum so anything that's going to move that that mitral valve from mm. the septum so that rip roaring diastolic flow in aortic regurg is going to increase e-point yeah. septal separation. I mean, all of the or, issues with fractional shortening. I mean, reasonable almost exactly. abnormalities and oblique exactly. cuts, foreshortened images, yeah. but also even more significantly, any mitral valve pathology. You know, if they've got any mitral stenosis, then that, that's going to reduce the excursion completely independently of exactly. the systolic function. Exactly. So it's something that theoretically is, it, it can be used. Um, it, I can understand the appeal of people using it, but it's pretty, isn't it's, it? It's pretty <laughs> and it's easy. And um, amusingly, there's actually a theoretical, a theoretically an equation yeah, that can exactly give you an ejection you. fraction I based on the, e, uh, the EPSS. Wow. And so it's 75.5 minus 2.5 <laughs> times EPSS. <laughs> so right, that's just in case just you're in case. Um, feeling a bit lazy, then absolutely feel free to use the EPSS. <laughs> <clears throat> Do I have, I think I have an abnormal E point septal separation to show people. So we said that cutoff value is less than six is normal, more yeah. than six is reduced ejection fraction. So we have a patient here that clearly has a reduced ejection fraction. Um, we've just gone and put the M mode cursor down at the tips of the mitral leaflet. You can see it's not perfect because it's not perpendicular, right? Because it's hard to, hard to do that. I mean, if we were doing it real, real time, we could have lined that up better, Chris, I mm -hmm. think. But you can see it's, I mean, it's crazily above six and that kind of goes with our eyeball, Absolutely. which is quite nice. Yeah. Um, so if we move yeah. on to some, some more kind of, um, some slightly more global assessments of LV function. So I think the natural progression in this is going to be fractional area change. So do you want to take us through this? Yes, as I mean, it's, it is what it says on the tin, you know, mm. it's the change in area between diastole and systole of your starting area. Yeah. Um, and then you get a percentage of that. So, I mean, again, it is, you know, it correlates with ejection fraction. 
reasonable to do. I guess we do it intuitively with our eyeball. So I, you know, I often visually assess how much that cavity is changing in size to sort of estimate my ejection fraction. And this just puts a little bit of objectivity to it. But it's it's again, it's looking at it's looking predominantly at that at that circumferential, that radial function of the ventricle, right, the mm. left ventricle, and we we've kind of purposely missed that out because all of these functions are looking at either the longitudinal function, the radial or circumferential function. They're not looking at that oblique crisscross fiber um, sort of arrangement, orthogonal arrangement of these fibers and how you have that twist untwist motion, mm -hmm. which is such an important part of LV yeah. function. Um, and none of these capture that. And this in particular, it's mainly looking at that radial function, right? So mm. how well the, the LV, you're slicing through it, it looks like a donut and then you you're measuring the, um, you know, the, the, the fractional area change, which yeah. I mean, it does correlate with with ejection fraction. But again, it's all of those, um, you know, caveats mm. that we so, talked about. So for those of us not experienced as experienced as you with echoes, so what we're doing, we're taking a parasomal short axis view. Sorry, yes. We're going to take it at that mid papillary level. Mid pap level, yeah. absolutely, yes. And then we're going to be pausing it in end diastole. We're going to be tracing all around that endocardial border, including the papillary muscles into our measurement, as you can see there. Yes. And then we're going to um, scroll forwards to end systole or to the smallest cavity size. Yes. And then we're going to be repeating that measurement. Yes. And then we're going to get two different areas and then the change in those areas is going to give us a percentage. Is that fair enough? That's that's really nice, Chris, much better than I could have said it. And it's um, you can see here that this is 60%. Yeah. Um, and I think our cutoff is 35, isn't it? So anything yeah. less than 35 is is abnormal, yeah. which matches what we were thinking visually there yeah. as well, doesn't it? Yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really important that your tracing is as accurate as it can be and that the pap muscles and the trabeculae or whatever, you know, those false tendons that we sometimes see are all sort of inside mm. uh, the LV cavity. Yeah. And the benefit of this is that you're seeing more than just two of the segments. You're yeah, assessing yeah. a cross-section of areas that are going to be um, having variable perfusion, um, variable kind of um, su uh, blood supply from different arteries. And so it could potentially take account for big regional warmest abnormalities. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I suspect this would correlate more with overall global function than mm -hmm. things like fractional shortening. Hey? Yeah. And I think the cardiac and these guys, they like mm -hmm. this a lot, yeah. particularly using transesophageal echo. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Using those transgastric views, getting a, a, a similar image to this. And then it's easy to be assessing the trend of the change in the systolic function. And it, also, if they block off any arteries during the operation, then you can immediately see changes in the regional, regional um, contraction. Yeah, its simplicity is very attractive, I yeah. must say. Um, and especially if you want to put some objectivity on your eyeball assessment. And particularly in, in theatre, you can imagine where the loading conditions and that dynamic change mm. is, is very rapid. Yeah. And so having that, that serial assessment with some um, numbers to hang your hat on is, you know, not a bad thing. No, absolutely. Yeah. So the last one we're going to talk about today is MAPSI. So what does MAPSI stand for? Oh, goodness. Uh, yes. Um, mitral annular planar systolic ex excursion. It's got a few other names, hasn't it? Like your atrioventricular displacement mm. index or something as well. But it's essentially how much that uh, mitral annulus is moving towards the apex in, in systole, like TAPSI, but on the other side. Yeah, it's exactly the same as doing TAPSI, yeah. which is taught in most of the uh, basic echo um, uh, uh, accreditation pathways, right? Most people will do a bit of TAPSI uh, to infer RV function. This is this is no different. Um, so again, we're going to be getting that apical four chamber view. Um, we're going to be trying to um, we're going to be aligning that cursor with both the lateral and the medial annulus, potentially taking an average of the two values, and then we're going to trace the shortening so the the excursion towards the probe um, by typically using a tapsy uh, sorry a mapsy measurement you've used a tapsy measurement here which I is did, it didn't have it didn't have sorry it didn't have a mapsy option yeah so I fair to enough. Do, do the tapsy fair enough yeah. and so we're going to be tracing that and avoiding that second second peak that we get after the initial one do you want to just point to that second peak that we get yeah it's this little thing here which is called the post systolic movement i think mm, PSM. something like that yeah. Um, and so we're going to be tracing it from the base all the way up to the, the peak. And then it's going to give us a, a value of that excursion. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's a controversial topic in itself. Mm. The British Society of Echo suggests one centimeter as a cutoff. Other things, other societies suggest 1.2 centimeters, and then some literature suggests maybe less than 0 0.8 might be when you really need to worry. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's worth mentioning because, you know, we're talking about LV function, the critically ill, you know, MAPSI possibly does have some prognostic value in the yeah. ICU. And that, again, makes sense to me because it's really an, perhaps an early marker of LV systolic dysfunction yeah. with the longitudinal fibres. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michelle Chu's group in London, in Sweden, looked at this, I think, in about 50 patients or something. And they actually averaged uh, the lateral and medial from the four chamber and the two chamber, and they averaged those values. And what they found is a MAPSI of less than eight seemed to be associated with, with worse outcomes. Um, and there's all sorts of things of causation, cor you know, versus um, correlation and, and what have you. And But I think it's still you know, potentially of value, particularly in the difficult to image patient, mm. you know, where these kind of things are still fairly easy to get. But I must admit at this, this moment in time doesn't form part of my usual toolkit to assess LV systolic function. No, I think it's, it's major value is um, kind of outpatient setting. I know we've got newer techniques now, but it's always been taught as being this early marker of my, of LV dysfunction, you know, prior to the maybe your ejection fraction changing, maybe in some infiltrative conditions such as amyloidosis, it's, absolutely. it absolutely is something that's affected prior to some of the radial or circumferential contraction. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's that's the theory and it um, definitely has a value there. Yeah, and it makes sense, right, a bit like your global longitudinal strain because mm. it's the fibres that are further away from your epicardial coronary blood supply. Yeah. So those are the kind of things that are going to go off first. It do, it's not accurate, though, is it, in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy? It's not. And uh, a little caveat for, for really for all of these methods that we've talked about today, you know, our populations have varying filling status um, and varying loading conditions. And these are all things that can affect every single one of these measurements that we do. And that means that all of these have got to be taken perhaps with a bit of a pinch of salt and not be used for uh, prediction of long term either long-term um, systolic function as a baseline of that patient. Is that fair yeah, to say? Very fair, Chris. Yeah. Nicely put. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. All of these are load dependent and that's what we're trying to sort of fight through in the critically ill, aren't we? How to sort of put it together with the loading conditions that we have mm. and that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it, you know, challenging. But um, yeah, that's... That's why we enjoy it, I think. Absolutely, mm -hmm. it is. Trying to make a difference to the patients. So we've clearly spent far too long today already. Yeah. And we're way over the 15 minutes, I'm sure. So um, I think we'll need to call it a day there. Um, next time we'll be continuing from this. Hopefully we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the Doppler techniques. So incorporating oh. tissue Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, looking at um, DP over DT. Um, we've got ejection fraction to talk about, which could be a whole session in itself. Um, maybe a few sessions. Maybe a few sessions. Yeah. Um, and then we'll move on to potentially touch on things like 3D, how you do that, how you do strain, and things like MPI, myocardial performance index, that currently doesn't form part of what I do, but um, yeah, yeah. A bit researchy, it's a bit researchy. It's a bit researchy. But also some of the cornerstones of what we need to do, including cardiac output to monitoring. So. Yes. Um, and I think we might have a few friends join us, Chris. We hopefully will have some friends join us. Yeah. Um, and hopefully um, that was relatively useful and enjoyable for people and we'd love to hear your feedback for all this stuff that we're doing Please. we are yep. um, this is a very dynamic process for us too so um, <laughs> our so loading conditions have changed throughout this whole they are changing dramatically <laughs> so um, if any feedback would be really um, appreciated and we'll see you next time thanks very much thank you bye